e a questo nuovo seminario della serie di incontri di scienza, società e tecnologia eh, due parole solo per presentare Ega Novotny eh, io credo, naturalmente non lo dico per retorica che sarebbe difficile immaginare un ospite migliore di Ega Novotny per questa serie di seminari che hanno, ricordo, lo scopo non solo di sensibilizzare eh, giovani ricercatori dell'università in generale insomma di parlare anche tra studiosi di discipline diverse dei temi eh, del rapporto scienza e società eh, per diversi motivi, non solo perché eh, Fiega Robotti è uno dei più grandi studiosi dei rapporti tra scienza e società, di quello che lei eh, autodefinisce social studies of science, eh, ma anche perché Fiega eh, Robotti eh, ricopre eh, dopo una lunga esperienza nell'ambito della, delle politiche della ricerca, ricopre in questo momento una delle cariche, una, la carica di vicepresidente eh, in una delle istituzioni eh, forse più innovative che l'Europa eh, abbia eh, creato dal punto di vista della politica della ricerca che è l'European Research Council. Eh, proprio questa mattina abbiamo avuto un incontro molto interessante in cui Elia eh, Robotni ci ha presentato in anteprima dei dati che sono stati eh, appena eh, presentati a Bruxelles sui eh, semi finalisti di queste borse molto competitive che l'Europea Research Council mette a disposizione in prima istanza ai giovani ricercatori e poi eh, in un secondo momento anche ai ricercatori con maggiore esperienza e, e quindi direi che combina una serie di caratteristiche davvero uniche, ripeto, quella di studiosa che ha sempre lavorato a stretto contatto eh, anche con gli scienziati naturali, gli scienziati di altre discipline, eh, di essere al centro dei processi di policy più innovativi, eh, di eh, aver pubblicato recentemente tra i suoi vari lavori un libro che raccomando a tutti, che si intitola Curiosità insaziabile e innovazione in un futuro fragile pubblicato anche in Italia da Codice, che è un libro non strettamente di sociologia della scienza, ma un libro che parla del concetto di innovazione, di come questo è cambiato, credo che oggi ne parlerà nella sua presentazione, eh, e, e in definitiva di quali strumenti oggi abbiamo per pensare la ricerca e l'innovazione in un futuro che lei definisce, poi ci spiegherà il perché, eh, fragile, e quindi eh, io ricevo immediatamente la parola, c'è una traduzione simultanea per chi eh, intendesse avvalersene, basta è sufficiente utilizzare le, le cuffie e al termine credo che sarà felice di accogliere le vostre domande anche in italiano. E io quindi ringrazio ancora Vengano Moto per aver accettato di intervenire ai nostri seminari e le do la parola. Thank you very much for this kind and very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. In fact, I must uh, admit it's the first time I'm in Trento, and so far I had a very favorable impression. The climate at the university today in our discussion was very encouraging that Trento is one of the universities that knows a little bit more than others where the future is. And I will begin with, uh, in my talk, to give you reasons why I think we have to prepare for a future that is not only unknown, as any of our concepts about the future must be, but that is fragile. And to give you some reasons and criteria why I think the future is fragile. Our thinking about the future is a changing attitude. And I would just like to remind you uh, that it was not so long ago, some 40 years, when the Club of Rome came out with its report on the limits of growth, a book that was translated into many languages, a book that was selling millions of copies and that had a major impact on public attitude towards what was then first seen a change in environmental degradation. And it was also the first time that a computer model was used 
to speak about the future, to engage the public in a discussion about the future. And I think this contributes to the impact you have. Now, if we go back and if we look at the book today with our present perception, we are struck by the fact not so much about the content. The crisis of the environment is still with us. It's very high on the political agenda. We all agree on that. But if we go back and if we look at the way how the Club of Rome imagined the future, one is struck by the fact that the authors of the book were certain about the future. There is a very deep underlying sense we know what the future is going to be. And, of course, it's the warning voice uh, that tells you, well, if we're not going to act, the catastrophe, namely environmental breakdown and degradation, is going to happen. But there is this very strong sense of confidence. We can tell you what the future is. And this also contributed to the enormous impact of the book, because the general public believe, first of all, what comes out of the computer model, there must be some robust truth to it. And secondly, if you can predict the future in such a detailed way, it must be uh, true. If we look at and compare this vision of the future, the way how the future was imagined then and now, one is struck by the fact that today, even if uh, neither the English language nor the Italian language permits it, we should speak of futures in the plural and not of one future. The future itself has become much more fragmented in our imagination. The future has also become much more risky. Instead of the one big catastrophe, by the way, the book never spoke about the nuclear catastrophe that could have happened uh, in those days. This was something the book did not look at. But instead of one big catastrophe, we are seeing many risks, some big, some smaller. We have new risks since 11th of September that are changing our political structures that give rise to the tension between liberty and security. So we have a different way in which we imagine the future. And this, of course, has been known to historians for a very long time, that it's not just our perception and imaginings of the past that change, but also about the future. Now, I would like to mention three features in the context of what I will then talk about, namely innovation and knowledge production, that I think are important for our understanding of the concept of innovation and of knowledge production as a way of coping with what I call the fragile future. Now, <clears throat> the first one may seem the most obvious of all. The future is uncertain and it is inherently so. This uh, has been known since the very beginnings and if you go back in the history of mathematics, for instance, the use of mathematics was very much driven by the impulse to be able to predict the future with the help of numbers, of connections between numbers that would describe not only the world as it is, but also uh, the future. The anticipation of an uncertain future is also a very strong driving force. And yet this uncertainty, and this is something that we realize much more now than before in history, the uncertainty of the future <coughs> is also shared by the uncertainty which is an inherent part of the process of research, and the uncertainty that is inherent in innovation. So there is a kind of convergence or uncertainty is permeating, not only being part of our imaginings of the future, but it is also part of the way how research uh, as a process is done. And I mean by research the process of the beginning of 
working at, on, on a problem where the outcome is not known. And we have uh, historians of science like Hunter Weinberger, a historian who, of biology who has looked at what he calls experimental systems, where uh, you can show with empirical case studies that uh, the scientists working on a problem do not know what answers will come out. In fact, you know the questions only once you perceive that certain answers uh, that you continue to work with have come to the force. So this uncertainty of the process of research, we are beginning to appreciate that this is part of the very definition of the research uh, program. And this has important policy consequences because you also have to explain to politicians why to fund uh, basic research if you cannot tell them what the deliverables will be, let alone what will come out. We can only give them the insurance 200 years from now something will have come out that can be usable, but you cannot give precise indications. And it's this inherent uncertainty that forms also part of the innovation process. And I will later try to speak about the different definitions of innovation. But uncertainty is equally inherent in the innovation process, because innovation, in a sense, can only be defined in retrospect by the success that it has had. Innovation, in fact, is the successful commercialization of a product or of a production process or of a social innovation once it has come about. So in retrospect, it can be tiny, but in the process itself, there are so many contingent factors that interact and that uh, play a role in it, of which research is one, an indispensable one, but it's, it's only one of them. And we are beginning to appreciate that uncertainty as an inherent feature is not only something to be feared, but it is something which is the reverse coin of an opportunity. Without uncertainty, you do not have an opportunity that you can uh, utilize. The second criteria for a fragile future, uh, I have to describe it with a word that is usually used as an adjective, but I will first use the noun. And the noun in English is latency. Usually we encounter latency as an adjective. In physics we speak about latent heat. In photography, very early on, the latent image was discovered that comes for um, only in the process. Medical doctors speak about a latent illness that comes to the fore and manifests itself at a certain point in time. And going back in, in history, it's interesting that the concept was already used in antiquity and it was used in antiquity to um, capture the hidden, the dark, the fateful side, side of Fortuna. Whether it's in nature or in politics, latency is that what is hidden and it's fateful and you don't quite know how to deal with it. And it was at the latest with Helmholtz who was experimenting on the delayed reflex of muscles that were excited, was uh, measuring the latency of the reaction of the physiological uh, system of human or animal uh, beings. So the idea of latency is there something that is hidden, that comes to the fore at a point that is difficult to pinpoint, it varies also by domain, what we are looking at. But there is the, the common theme that you try to measure, to objectivize, to experiment with a process that is not open to, to be seen. And that is not there from the very beginning, but we don't quite know what is happening, but it is emerging. 
So why do I think that the later future is now becoming one important aspect of the way how we speak about the future? Because I think that um, the sciences, and um, by sciences I always include technology because science and technology has become uh, much more entangled. We speak about techno-sciences very often. <clears throat> because I, I think that um, the sciences, the life sciences, um, as a prominent example, are becoming more and more producers of a latent future and our knowledge about the latent future. And by this I mean the amount of predictive, prognostic, diagnostic technology that is now at our disposal. The onset of a disease that may or may not happen later in the life course can be diagnosed through genetic tests. One uh, breast cancer gene, uh, BRAC1 and BRAC2, that has been given a lot of prominence also in the media. And this has led uh, some women who have been diagnosed to carry this particular gene of uh, choosing surgery. And as one of the women describes it, I want to be a pre-viver, not a survivor. So, I find this an interesting, novel concept. You want to be able to act before you actually know uh, whether the disease indeed breaks out. So, we are dealing also with a new kind of knowledge, probabilistic knowledge, that is produced with the help of diagnostic tools that are now available. And Craig Venter, to cite another example, who, as you know, has recently uh, published and publicized his entire uh, genome, uh, said, uh, and I quote him now, what we are all going to find out is that with some very rare exceptions, every human trait is a statistical probability resulting from a number of genes working together. So you have this new form of knowledge which is probabilistic knowledge about our own future that becomes part of the latency uh, of uh, the future. But it's not only the life sciences, it's also the way how we know what we know about climate change. What we know about climate change is um, long before it was evident that uh, ice shelves are breaking apart and uh, there is now the Northwest Passage that is being uh, opened up for the first time in the, in the Arctic. Long before this was visible to uh, an untutored eye, there were already the numerical simulation and modelings about global climate change going on. And again, with the power of these calculations, we are gaining a knowledge about the future that is latent in the sense that uh, something will reveal itself about the climate and, and its alteration in the distant or not so distant future and it should uh, indeed give us enough knowledge to act upon today. So we are kind of experimenting in a new way with diagnosis, we are experimenting with modeling through calculations as if it were a prognosis on the future and we are anticipating the future that is latent, that may or may not turn into a manifest phenomenon. And again, of course, it is linked with uncertainty. The third criteria is perhaps the one that you have not heard uh, uh, about before, and therefore I need uh, to, to explain it a bit better. I call it, um, it is linked to the performativity of theory. And performativity is a term that um, is used among lawyers and the law has been performative 
things ever, because if the law uses certain formulas, it acts and it is binding among the ones where it is produced. If the King of England produced Robin Hood to be an outlaw, which is the famous story of the Middle Ages, Robin Hood was an outlaw. If you uh, get married uh, and you are pronounced man and husband, your husband and wife rather, uh, then you are husband and wife by law. So this is the performative power of law or any legal contract. Uh, and um, the performativity is not limited to the law. And one uh, very famous example about the performativity of theory is that of financial markets. Now, financial markets, as we know from everyday newspaper reports for the last month or so at, uh, at least, financial markets have grown tremendously in importance, in impact, and what happens in the US has repercussions everywhere in the world, or what happens in the Southeast Asia region has repercussions around the world, etc. But simultaneously, with the growth of financial markets, there was also a growth and emergence of something that is called modern finance theory. Now, modern finance theory are theoretical models using um, mathematics, which from mathematicians is not so sophisticated for what economists use it. It uses sophisticated economic theorizing. And this finance theory was put forth as a way of describing what happens in the market. Now, what these theories did was they described a phenomenon that was discrepant from the actual behavior of the market. But slowly, the markets and the people acting in the markets started to orient themselves by the theories. So the theories should predict that prices should reach a certain level and then they would act in a, in, in a certain way, you would buy or sell. Um, and there was gradually a convergence between the description of the model and of the theory and the actual behavior of people and of the phenomenon, in this case, how prices in the financial markets went up or went down. So we can say, and there have been studies, um, for instance, by Donald McKenzie, one of the foremost uh, people who have written on this, that show very clearly that finance theory has had a enormous impact on and effect on the markets. And there were three persons who actually got the Nobel Prize in Economics, which is not the real Nobel Prize, but it's the prize of the Bank of Sweden uh, for economics, and this was Black Scholes and Merton for their model. And uh, Donald McKenzie, for instance, has in detail described how this model informed practices, how this created patterns of prices for which the model was a good description until in 87 the whole system crashed. And uh, this was one of the reasons for <coughs> going back and looking at this interaction between the way how we describe the world and how the world so described comes to resemble uh, the model. Now, I'm using this third criteria for a fragile future because I would say that it's not only in financial markets that theories affect actual behavior, but that is taking place in a number of social and other organizations today. Through so the forms of auditing, of management practices, of best practices, we have set up a system in which we are describing how we should behave. We are setting ourselves targets. People actually start to behave this way. If not, they will be sanctioned. And so eventually, our organizations and our behavior start to resemble 
the moment. Now, this may be a good thing in some cases, but it always carries this extra risk, like with the financial crash in 87, that it also may turn out that the world does not conform to what the model is, uh, prescribes you. But I think that the performativity of theory is affecting our behavior more and more. It is, of course, related to what sociologists a long time ago called self-fulfilling prophecy. Only, I think, a prophecy uh, is perhaps a, a more archaic word for describing what uh, these um, very sophisticated models would not like to be described as, as, as prophetic. And so, by forecasting the future as fragile, uh, unless the organization strives to improve itself, it fails to meet its ever new targets, um, uh, then uh, the future becomes more fragile. So I think by taking these three criteria together, the uncertainty of the future that is inherent, but which is now shared widely with uh, research and with innovation, together with the latency of phenomena that are described, that are produced through the knowledge we have uh, through diagnostics, through numerical simulation, and the performativity of theory, the fact that theories can act on our behavior and on phenomena, the future has become more fragile. Now, if this is so, how can we prepare for this fragile future? And the way to prepare it, that is at the center of my uh, contribution here, is of course innovation and knowledge production. Now, <clears throat> let me first turn uh, towards innovation. And here it is interesting to ask yourself, first of all, why do we speak so much about innovation today? There are the obvious reasons that you get. Europe uh, no longer is uh, the major power of the world. In fact, this is a long time ago that Europe was a, a world power. We now have the rise of China and India to compete with us. So these are the obvious reasons. And another obvious reason, of course, is that the way forward is through knowledge production, through innovation and not by investing into agriculture, as the European Union state uh, does. But, I would say, beyond the obvious reasons, uh, it is worthwhile to ponder the question, why are we almost so obsessed about innovation? The answer I give in the book, and, and I, I will not speak about uh, this particular aspect so much, the answer uh, in, in, that I give in the book has to do with the uncertainty and the fragility of the future. Because we do not know how to handle, how to cope with this fragile future. We need a way to protect ourselves against it. And we do it through the belief in innovation. It's, it's a belief. And of course, innovation also happens at the, at the activity, but a lot of the rhetoric, the discourse about innovation, has this exhortative element, the rhetorical element. We have to believe in innovation. It will save us um, and protect us from all this uncertainty that is connected to, uh, with the future. But this is, so to say, a functional ex explanation, if you want, a social function of, of innovation. But <clears throat> there is, of course, much more to uh, innovation as, as an activity. It is used everywhere as a term. We look for it in the statistics. We compare ourselves in benchmarking exercises and the like. There are reports like the famous AHO report uh, that was put uh, forward by the former Prime, uh, Prime Minister of Finland, Mr. AHO, who wants Europe to become more innovation friendly and has some ideas of how this could be reached. And there are uh, attempts also to measure innovation. 
and uh, going back and looking precisely what is being measured, you discover some interesting uh, features of it. First of all, there is an Oxford Handbook of Innovation, uh, edited by three well-known uh, figures of, uh, of, of the field, uh, Fagerberg, Maori and uh, Rosenberg. And these are economists who have been working on the phenomenon of innovation. And they claim that the scholarly articles in the social science literature between 1955 and 2004 have risen to 20%. Now, somebody measured this figure, and it turns out to be wrong, but nevertheless, there is a steep increase in articles that carry the word innovation in the title. And uh, Edouard Godin, who is a historian of uh, ideas and a historian of concepts, has uh, gone back and uh, looked at the history of the concept and its measurement. What he found is the following thing. First of all, he found that innovation is a relatively recently used concept. In the 30s of the last century, it was mainly sociologists dealing with it, and they were describing something called social change. They were describing something called social diffusion of invention. So it was invention, social change, social diffusion, but not the word innovation so much. But then uh, the concept was successively narrowed to technological innovation. And there was also a change in the statistical measurement of innovation. And you may have heard of the Frascati Manual, which is one of the uh, Bibles for statisticians in the R-D&I field, as it's now called, Research, Development and Innovation. And in the Frascati Manual, the amount of investment in R&D was taken as a proxy for innovation. So you did not know how much innovation was actually occurring in a country or in a sector or in an industry. So people said, tell me how much R&D do you devote to pharmaceutical uh, industry, for instance, compared to uh, metallurgy or uh, manufacturing. And this would tell you how much innovation. So it was an indicator by proxy. The problem with this indicator is that, first of all, it privileges large firms, because only large firms do invest in R&D, and so only innovation that would occur in small places, in small firms, incremental innovation would be left out of the picture. But also what uh, this measurement does is that uh, it's very difficult to trace the actual genesis of a technology. So you can say an invention occurred then and there, but then it's very difficult to trace exactly when did an innovation occur that is based on that invention. So in the year 1992, a new definition was adopted, and very few people know about this, and this has become part of the Oslo Manual. And the change in the Oslo Manual foresees now you ask the firms, you ask the people who are supposed to innovate, how much do you innovate? And lo and behold, the, the uh, innovation activity went up enormously, because every firm said, we do quite a bit of innovation. It had the advantage that you are now asking also the medium and small-sized firms about their innovative activity. But at the same time, you must realize the limits of it. So I'm mentioning these seemingly technical details to show how much a concept that is used very much by policymakers, by decision makers, what every government in Europe wants is the country, the industry, the university to innovate, innovate, innovate. How much this is based and linked to the measurement and the statistics that are being used of the activity that you want to describe and that you want uh, to compare. And <clears throat> therefore, 
I think we have to, uh, to differentiate between innovation as an activity that occurs and the way how we speak about it, the discourse on innovation and the actual activity. And we do have measurements for technological activity. We do not have measurements on social innovation. Social innovations are as important, one could argue, as technological innovation. In fact, most technological innovations need presupposed or are followed by changes in the organization of the unit, of the firm, of the relationships uh, where the technological innovation enters. Yet this is invisible to the public eye and to our own perception because we don't have statistics uh, about it. And one more point I want to make about uh, innovation. One cannot speak about innovation without mentioning the name of Josef Schumpeter, one of the first people Schumpeter wrote uh, in, in 1911, so it's uh, almost 100 years ago, about innovation. And uh, the changes that have occurred since. Now, for Schumpeter, innovation was the new combinations of elements that were already there. And the new combinations that he saw, or the elements that he saw, were products. It was the production processes. It was the sources of supply, including finance. So he was already very much aware of venture capital, even if he did not call it like that. New markets and new organizational forms of business. So in a, in a sense, Schumpeter got it right. But what Schumpeter did not see and could not foresee at his time was how much uh, radical innovations make a difference. And by radical innovation, we mean innovations that are science-based, that open up a new long-term change and a restructuration of sectors, of behaviors, etc. And one of these radical innovations certainly was the computer and the way how the computer led to ICT and uh, the changes that we've witnessed through. So this is something that in Schumpeter's view was simply not there. And also for him it was still the lonely, heroic figure of the entrepreneur, the one who was leading the pack of imitators as he described it. While today we have a much more complex uh, organizational form of networks. We have users who are part of the innovation process. And for some firms, the users are the most important innovators because the firm prefers the users to innovate because their own company lawyers say the users can do things that you in the company cannot do. So we have this very complex networks um, of innovation that, that occurs. And again, this is something that should be a democracy. Now, <clears throat> from innovation, we move on to knowledge production. And here, one has to mention the linear model, uh, which is the way how the process of leading from basic research to applied research to applications that take place in the commercialized markets uh, has been described as the linear model. Now, uh, there was a famous uh, document, a manifesto, written by Vannevar Bush in 1945. Uh, it was written in July 1945. The American forces were still fighting the war in, in Japan. And Vannevar Bush proposed to the President of the United States a bold new vision for science called Science the Endless Frontier. We will recognize the American metaphor of the frontier that is in the title and in the thinking. And he proposed, among other things, um, a vision that the scientists who had been working in Los Alamos, who had been working frantically in Los Alamos, 
to be able to produce the atomic bomb before the uh, Nazis could produce one and to end the war. In fact, that the way of working in great autonomy with sufficient funds, which was Los Alamos, you were given all the freedom because the military needed a result as quickly as possible, and you were given unlimited funds to do the work. That these kind of ideal working conditions could also be uh, found when they returned to the universities, because of course they did not want to stay in Los Alamos, they wanted to go home to their uh, physics departments or engineering departments, but enjoy the same kind of freedom and possibilities that they had in Los Alamos. So this was the vision that uh, was behind uh, the document. And so Pamela Bush uh, proposed something that would later on become the National Science Foundation, which in a sense is also a predecessor for the, for, for, for the ERC, if you want to go back in, in genealogy that, uh, that much. And Pamela Bush uh, never used the term linear model, but it is clear for him sort of the vision he gives to the President of the United States is you start with basic research and basic research means research, you have no idea what will come out of it, you give the scientists the freedom, then something will happen to make it apply and then something will happen to make it commercially viable. Now this something turned out to be much more complex than any linearity would imply. So we know today it is much more complex. We know that in many um, areas of the life sciences today, it is not possible to distinguish this is still basic, this is already applied, because the biotechnology, the research instruments you need in order to get on with your basic research are already applied knowledge and lead to applied knowledge and uh, <clears throat> as somebody said about the life sciences, knowing life is remaking life. So you cannot know life without altering what you are working on. So from this point of view, the linear model uh, is obsolete, but we have not found a good substitute for it. We see the complexity, we see the messiness, we see the feedback mechanisms that are there, but we have not found a way of uh, substituting it really, but we know it is obsolete. And I think also what is underestimated is the importance of research technology that lead from basic research to innovation. And this is something that the Americans are much better at than the Europeans to let in um, in the interaction with industry already in that phase where research technologies can be transferred and made industrially interesting. Now, <clears throat> for knowledge production, this is the broad picture I have painted. Uh, innovation and knowledge production stand in a very complex non-linear relationship, even if the direction is, of course, there to start with basic research, uh, there's no way of, of getting around it. But institutions also matter. And in a recent article, <coughs> Andrea Bonacossi, an economist who in his acknowledgement mentions Trento, so we must have some affiliation with Trento, um, wrote an interesting article uh, with the title Explaining Poor Research Performance of European Science. And he argues that uh, if you compare research performance in Europe with what happens in, uh, in, in the US, it uh, turns out that uh, what matters very much are the kind of institutions you have. And what he means by that is that he says, if you look at the fields in which Europeans excel, it is mathematics, it's physics, it is chemistry, it's sort of the traditional, in the best sense of the world, disciplines that uh, grew up and flourished within what, again, in an idealized way, you could say, was the Humboldtian University. 
But now, if you look at the more recent dynamic developments in the life sciences, in information and communication technologies, you see a much more heterogeneous field, you see all kinds of interactions between um, researchers coming from different uh, disciplines, you see rapidly shifting priorities because the dynamics of knowledge production is very fast. So something may be the hot topic today, but six months from now it's no longer the hot topic. So you have this very dynamic development going on. And he says here European institutions, and in particular universities, are not very good at it. So I refer to, to what Andrea uh, Bonacossi has many figures and empirical material uh, put forward in, in, in this article. And I mention it here because I think indeed institutions do matter and uh, that we have to give also proper attention to the way how institutions are designed and how institutions change and how they are shaped if we want them to uh, have their place in innovation and knowledge production. But in the end, if you look at institutions, at good management, and good management, let me remind you, is a very important feature of any institution, of any organization, but it's not the same as scientific leadership. And you need both. You need good management and you need scientific leadership in order to be successful in what I'm talking about. But you also need and this is, in the end, the gist of my, my story. You also need the individual as the curious and curiosity-driven researcher. It is the individual that counts with his and her curiosity. And curiosity, which is the title of, of my book, curiosity um, is an emotion. Curiosity is a passion. You are seized by a passion. You claim that you are not entirely responsible. In the Code Napoleon, there was still the, the crime de passion, the crime of passion. If you would murder your wife in an act of jealousy, you would get a, you could get a more lenient sentence. This was the idea of passion being overpowering you. Now, I'm not saying um, today this would not count as an excuse not only for killing your wife, but also uh, ethics is a very important consideration. So we can no longer say curiosity takes us where it takes us and we are to be excused. But curiosity is an important precondition for arguing that science and any form of creativity, be it scientific, be it artistic, needs a space of autonomy. At the same time, we must recognize that society tries to tame curiosity because curiosity is amoral, not immoral. It is amoral. It does not know where it will lead you. You are driven by it. And at one point you're realizing, well, maybe I've gone too far, or maybe something will come out that should perhaps better not come out. So society has always tamed and tried to tame curiosity. The problem, of course, is to know the balance. If you tame curiosity too much, it will be stifled, it will be kicked, it will disappear. And society is trying to tame curiosity in various ways. There is the way to tame it economically. Economic taming means you try to channel curiosity in certain directions that are interesting in terms of profit, which is the legitimate motive for any industry and economic activity. So you find in the biomedical field, you find a phenomenon like orphan diseases. Diseases uh, by which too few people in the world are affected for industry to make it worthwhile uh, to have a major research effort in that direction. So this is one example among many how taming 
in the sense of trying to channel curiosity in some directions and not in others can be harmful. Intellectual property rights is necessary to protect the investment at the same time we also know there is a, a backside to it. It can stifle innovation, it can stifle creativity if you have too many hurdles to overcome. Likewise with ethical concerns or demands for governance and participatory governance. It uh, takes you, uh, ethical guidelines are accepted uh, as, uh, by any scientist as being part of the way how science has to tame curiosity. At the same time, we realize that if it is overdone and if you have only one ethical guideline following the other, you will not get on with your, your research. And the same holds for the third taming effort, namely to do it through auditing, to do it through financial controls. If uh, you do too much of it, uh, you can kill scientific curiosity and creativity at the same time. So, curiosity is the main driving force. It comes from a very powerful motivation which resides in the individual, but in order to unfold it needs both the right institutional context and it needs a society that has to tame it, but at the same time does not overdo the taming. And it is this kind um, of balance which is the hallmark of the good governance of research that we all are, are striving for. Now I want to conclude by coming back uh, to, the, to the theme of the, of, of the future once more. We know from historians that it was around 1750 for the first time that in Western society something like an open horizon of the future became a dominant feeling among contemporaries of uh, no longer looking at the past as the gold standard of behavior, of objectives, of the meaning of existence, but perceiving that there is an open horizon of a future in which improvement is possible and the experience creating a sort of um, tension, a difference between expectations and between the experience. And this, of course, has been a very powerful driving force of the belief in progress, which was part of the Enlightenment, which was part of the Western tradition. The belief in progress was so strong that uh, it entailed the idea that progress through science, progress through technology, would also bring progress social progress in terms of equity, you would have enough wealth and uh, we would distribute it equally in society, which we know did not happen, nor moral improvement. So scientific and technological progress did not mean, contrary to what was believed in the times of the Enlightenment, that moral improvement uh, and moral progress would progress that we have seen um, a number of um, falling backs into um, stages of, of barbary and, uh, and, and uh, the last century is full of um, these incidents where the civilized nations behaved in a, in a most terrible way. The time horizon today, and with this I come back to the fragile future, uh, is such that we have more instruments, more knowledge about the future through the way how we can look inside our bodies, how our genetic makeup tells us something about diseases that we might get in, in the future or not. How we have modelings about uh, the natural world and what it would mean in terms of our well-being and the well-being of the planet and, and the life. So the potential 
of science and technology is there, it's enormous. We have new instruments and new ways of getting to know this future, but it is a fragile future. And yet at the same time, let me remind you that any potential exists only in the present. A potential can only be realized by focusing, by shedding. It is like with information. Information, unless you reduce it to the essentials, floods you with irrelevant information. It is not information. So in order to realize the potential, we have to face the constraints that exist today. And the constraints are partly financial, we've spoken about this uh, at, at, uh, more today. Partly they are institutional constraints, as I mentioned before, our, our institutions, um, the best ones for the kind of knowledge that is being produced at the forefront of knowledge today. And they are societal in the sense that uh, does the experience that uh, we make individually with science and technology, is this translated into a collective experience that is being shared or not? In other words, can this uh, creative tension between experience and expectation be kept as a creative tension or do our expectations become unrealistic? Or do some people just say we have no expectation anymore or just distort it? So I will end by saying um, thank you. I think uh, the fragile future is around us, in front of us, but also around us. And uh, the way of coping with the fragile future is certainly by investing into innovation, into knowledge production, but to do so in a reflexive manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you have any questions, please. Is there a mic or not? Uh, I, th I, think, I, think I think we can hear you. you if you, if the you the mic, I'm, I'm using the mic for the for the uh, interpreter. You have a good assistant. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't work. Uh, no, 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 no. Battery is off. That's my So, so my name is uh, Themis Palmanas. I'm currently a, a professor of com com computer science at the University of. Uh, I think that uh, my question is at the heart of uh, uh, the basic research and goes back to, to something that, that you mentioned earlier. Uh, having spent 10 years in North America, I can't help uh, comparing the higher education systems of uh, America and Europe. And I think that, uh, that there are three main things there. The first is, uh, 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 and they all relate to the to the, to the graduate school. So the, 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 the first has to do with the way uh, that we guide graduate students to basic research. Uh, the second has to do with uh, the funding that uh, supports this kind of research. And, 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 and the third relates to the way that uh, uh, technolo technological transfer happens between uh, universities and uh, uh, the industry, which uh, is a bidirectional uh, tra transfer. So it seems to me, it seems to me that uh, for, for the first point, uh, Europe is proposing the three-year-long PhD degree, which I'm not sure how much it promotes basic research. For the second point, uh, I very much welcome uh, the efforts done by ERC, but uh, I have the impression that uh, uh, given the, the, the numbers of the ERC, this is not the focus of Europe. And uh, for the third point, the technology transfer between universities and uh, the industry, I'm not really sure what uh, Europe is, is, is doing. So I'm wondering, what are, the, uh, are there any uh, discussions, any efforts, and uh, is there the way to, to, to change things in uh, this uh, context in, in Europe? I'd like your comment, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, I would say um, <clears throat> actually basis uh, of the ERC is very much the realization that especially in the young researchers in Europe do not have the kind of early independence, early scientific independence uh, as their colleagues enjoy in the United States. In the United States you have uh, junior faculty and your senior faculty. And the only difference between them is the senior faculty is established and the young faculty is, the junior faculty is, is younger. But there is no difference in terms of intellectual or scientific uh, level. And we have to get to a similar uh, culture in treating our best bright young people as uh, our American colleagues do. And everyone who has lived and worked in the US has come back with this experience. It does not matter who says what, it matters what you say. And this is part of it. So setting up the starting ground was very much driven by the desire to give to European younger researchers an earlier independence. Now, I realize that the numbers to be funded are far too small. But let me remind you, we just had the first call now. We have 559 semi-finalists, which would have been funded had we have the money. So not having the money means we have to cut them down into, into half, and this is a painful process. However, with the seven, six years stay to go, there will be six more possibilities, and at the end of the seventh framework program, I think there will be a sufficient number of very well-qualified young researchers who will embody this new, new spirit, uh, I think. In terms of um, industry, university relations, I mean, much has been said, much has been uh, written about it. We know where the problems lie. And one of the problems in Europe is that European industry does not invest enough in research. The figures are very clear on that. The European industry, through the history of the previous uh, framework programs, feels hampered. They feel, you know, they have the right to get subsidies instead of making an effort on their own. So the problems are known, the diagnosis is there, but the action is missing. And this was also the gist of the AHO report, um, basically. So, where does action come from? The Commission says it's up to the member states. The member states say it's up to the regions. Uh, and so on. So everyone is you know, saying the other one has to, has to act before. So, there is no obvious uh, solution for it. Except, um, I would say, there are some hopeful signs uh, going on in Europe. And the hopeful signs point in the direction of um, international competitive competition. You can only be good if your colleagues worldwide evaluate you as being good. It does not help if only your local environment says you are good. So to expose yourself to this kind of international um, competition and to know that uh, somehow the young generation has to do what so far in Europe has not happened, to bridge this gap between we are university and they are industry and we are better than them or vice versa. So in order to get to this kind of dynamic interaction and transfer, the, the new generation has to do it. And it's up to the universities to um, impart this spirit 